Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to the panel today, and we're looking forward to a great discussion. Um, my name is Linda Sheehan, and um, each of the panel members will introduce themselves in a moment, and we'll jump right into presentations, so we try to have enough time for a dialogue with you all. Um, uh, I am executive director of Planet Pledge. Um, it's an organization that's working to advance both investment and philanthropic solutions to climate change, particularly in the area of renewable energy, but also uh, as well as increasing energy efficiency and then reducing greenhouse gas emissions through waste management. So our goal is to try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions quickly um, with proven solutions. Uh, and before this, I'm an attorney and I've worked for about two decades in the NGO community and most recently working to advance uh, new legal regimes for rights of nature. Um, I will um, allow the other folks to introduce themselves um, in the order that they'll be speaking so you can learn a little bit more about us and we'll, we'll pass a mic later on after we're done. So please save up your questions so we can have a great interactive dialogue later. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, um, Sergio, I think, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, good morning. My name is Sergio Zaransky. I'm a director of JANSA. It's a small organization. Uh, we um, work together with indigenous communities in Latin America, starting also now in Africa, uh, on two different aspects. On one hand, safeguarding collective rights in the context of the transition to renewable energy, and on the other hand, supporting communities that want to develop utility scale projects uh, with socio environmental objectives on their land. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Samantha Hargreaves. I work for an African alliance called Woman. Um, we work to support women's organizing and movement building, um, opposing e destructive extraction of natural resources and proposing development alternatives uh, from an eco-feminist uh, women's rights perspective. Um, we formed in uh, 2012, we launched in 2013, so we are a very new network. We work in 12 countries across East, West and Southern Africa. Hi, I'm uh, Hannibal Rhodes. I'm from the Gaia Foundation, which is a UK-based NGO working internationally uh, with land-based communities and indigenous peoples to safeguard their lands and uh, their biocultural diversity, so the, the connection between nature and culture. Um, we are, I'm, my focus particularly within Gaia is focused on extractivism and the extractive industries and the impacts of those on communities as well as the alternatives that we hope to talk about today. Thanks, everybody, and um, we'll just jump right in, and uh, some will speak from here, and I'll speak over there, uh, and we, most of us have a PowerPoint, so feel free to um, ask us about that later. Thanks. So this is the obligatory um, everything is in trouble slide. Um, I don't think I need to go into this in too much detail with this audience. But uh, as we know, the time is now to take action. Um, we're starting to see very significant impacts that are potentially irreversible. So we need to be able to take action in a meaningful way. But that doesn't mean that we also want to take, we also want to take action in a wise and thoughtful way. So we do know that full implementation of the Paris Agreement uh, is not going to be quite enough. Um, we need to do Paris Plus, and we're starting to see more studies that say that we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions even faster than we had hoped uh, in order to stay below at least a 2 degrees C threshold, preferably 1.5 degrees C. So the UN has rightfully called for investment in the order of trillions. We need to redo our fossil fuel supported economy and make it low carbon uh, or no carbon if possible as soon as we can. Um, and that's trillions, not billions of investment. Fortunately, and I apologize, this is the tiniest type in the PowerPoint, um, investment solutions are growing worldwide, and many uh, panels are talking about the permutations of this on all different levels, from sustainable ag to waste management uh, to renewable energy to energy efficiency. And we are seeing our low carbon future approaching. Uh, people are working on this. Renewable energy is getting much cheaper, um, often mo more cheap than fossil fuels. Uh, energy efficiency could save trillions of dollars in the next few decades, 
and then modernized waste management both reduces greenhouse gas emissions and allows us to be able to recycle and reuse uh, what nature is giving us. Sorry, it's a little trouble with this. Can you push forward one? Thanks, it's not. Thank you. Um, so just as one example, um, Kansas, a uh, state in the United States, um, not viewed as the most environmentally friendly state. Um, not Climate change is not really at the top of the list. But wind energy has become a significant and growing portion of its energy portfolio, uh, not only reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also saving people money. Um, so looking across the different types of benefits that you could have with renewable energy, looking across the sustainable development goals, um, really around the world we're starting to see significant change. Try it again. Ah, there we go. Um, so what are some of the trends that we're seeing? You know, at Planet Pledge, we talk to a lot of different people who are interested in investing in renewable energy and really making a difference. Um, you know, the, the, the UN's talking about investment to shift to a low carbon economy, and they're also talking on a separate track about the sustainable development goals, but we think that we can do this uh, together um, and reach for systemic change, and we're seeing that people are talking about that more and more. They're realizing that investments that look not just at reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also investing in um, positive environmental, social, and governance results um, also makes the most sense financially. Those projects do the best. And we're also seeing people look at identifying specific target impacts, how much greenhouse gas emissions reduced, how many good jobs are being produced, and measuring those, identifying those. So we're seeing demand increasing for these types of investments that do good and do well. And the question that we'll be looking at today and uh, diving into more deeply is how do we look at uh, guiding this interest, this change, into something that's really transformative. Um, and transformative investments are uh, allowing us to be able to move to the next level where we're looking at how to live in a way that's more harmonious with the Earth, such as uh, the UN talks about in its Harmony with Nature initiative. And the Paris Agreement talks about this. Uh, the Climate Agreement says that it's imperative to ensure a just transition to this low-carbon future. And it emphasizes our obligations to human rights, community rights, uh, the rights of indigenous peoples, including but not limited to free, prior, and informed consent. So this needs to be something that's meaningful um, in terms of how we move forward with going from billions to trillions. And recognizing community needs is an important part of this. So the Paris Agreement also talks about climate justice, and climate justice is with regard to human communities, of course, um, but it also specifically talks in the Paris Agreement about climate justice, including justice for natural systems, and it talks about uh, ensuring the integrity of all ecosystems and the protection of biodiversity towards uh, a whole Mother Earth. So we're looking at climate justice in a broad, systemic way, in a holistic way. Um, how we act, it, we can't really isolate our challenges. We don't live single challenge lives, so we need to be able to look at our solutions in a multiple way, in a holistic way. So to reiterate, switching, to fossil, uh, switching off fossil fuels towards renewable energy is absolutely essential. We need to do this. But also, in addition to that, we can look at how we transition to renewable, to energy efficiency, to sustainable agriculture culture and think about how we get there and all the different pieces of that and what we do with communities is an important part of this discussion. One vision that is articulated by one of the partners that we work with that looks at impact investing is uh, their goal is a world in which our environmental and social goals are looked at first and that guide us to identify what investments that we want to use. And that's an, it's a good example of how we can think more holistically and systemically and thinking about how these actions enhance the integrity of the Earth community. So what does this mean in terms of community leadership towards our low carbon future? Um, there are a number of ideas that the other panelists who are working and living in these particular areas and taking action on the ground, and I want to save time for them to go into their work in much more detail. 
Um, but here are some potential ideas that we can think of when we're thinking what is transformative investment? Um, what is involving communities look like? What is involving nature in the decision making look like? Uh, just a few thoughts and I look forward to your thoughts during the Q&A. So one thing of course is communication and we need a better way to communicate between people who are interested in investing, uh, getting to those trillions, and the communities where uh, renewable investment, where sustainable ag, where all of these different strategies will be located. We need a good way of conversing with each other, and we'll hear about that. We also need to think about what wealth means and how we share wealth. We uh, share our planet, we share the wind, we share the sun. How do we share the wealth from all of that with the communities and with the, uh, the natural world as well? And one way of thinking about sharing wealth with the natural world is thinking about we're switching to renewables in order to start to address and slow some of the damage we've done. How do we also restore the damage we've done? How do we put back the wealth of the natural world, the biodiversity, uh, the integrity of ecosystems that the Paris Agreement talks about? How do we do that through our financial decision making as well? It's not something we very actively do, but it's certainly something we can do. Um, and one way to do that is to help shift our laws um, and our actions to reflect nature's rights and nature's voice. Um, inher the, the inherent rights of nature to a healthy climate will help guide us to the right decision making. And then we need to think about how we make decisions and investments as well. Uh, we look at due diligence in terms of whether uh, an idea is a good idea financially, whether a company is sound. But then also we're starting to see people looking at diligencing the environmental costs and benefits, the social costs and benefits, and really diving deeply into these particular ideas and looking at whether this is the right thing holistically for us to be doing and how we can make it even better. Because again, we're seeing that these types of investments that look across environmental, social, and governance factors and really meaningfully account for them are the ones that also are doing better financially. So it's, it's a win-win all around. And then finally, through new accounting standards, um, new ways of measuring how we're doing it, holding ourselves accountable, we want to be able to accurately and consistently report on the environmental and social costs and benefits of the investments that we're doing. And, and additionally, having a consistent way of looking at investments so we can compare them is important, but also each investment in this area is, is unique um, and important. And so identifying the specific targets that we want to achieve um, through each of these investments and then holding ourselves accountable and reporting back to investors and reporting back to the community and allowing communities to identify what those targets are that mean something for them and then to be able to help with the reporting back and own some of this project and moving forward to own the larger wealth of what we all communally hold um, on this shared planet uh, is a way for us to start to think about what is transformative investment, how do we implement the Paris Agreement and go one step forward. Um, just in summary, we mentioned at the beginning, we, we know that the time to act is now. The Paris Agreement is a great first step and we need to do more. The Sustainable Development Goals are a way to push us towards thinking more systemically. Uh, the Paris Agreement allows us to be able to engage communities, but engaging is just one step. We need communities to lead us. We need nature to lead us. How do we listen? Um, we're going to be hearing more about that from the other panelists. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, community ownership, you know, community leadership in the renewable energy transition uh, in the Global South. Um, and the first point, uh, the first question is why does uh, community leadership matter? Um, I mean, it matters on its own, you know, it's, uh, it has a number of, of there's, there's very solid reasons why we should have the communities leading the transition on its own right. But in addition to that, there is a number of additional factors that need to be taken into account to understand how the transition is unfolding in the Global South. I'm going to speak about them uh, on the basis of one specific case, that's where the pictures come from. That's in Oaxaca, Mexico, in southern Mexico. Uh, it's a region that is uh, all indigenous. Uh, it's called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And uh, the picture that you see on the bottom left is um, a picture produced by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory from the United States. And what it shows is basically the equivalent of an inexhaustible oil field, but it's clean energy, it's wind. Um, you don't see it from there, but uh, most of the region is off chart. The quality of the wind is, is classified from poor to excellent. And then they had to add, uh, add two additional categories beyond excellent. 
and most of the region is uh, in that category, in those, two, in those two categories. But this has resulted into, it's a rush of uh, Western companies going there and obtaining land rights uh, without knowledge or consent from these communities, uh, basically through very dubious and corrupt mechanisms uh, through the state of Oaxaca, uh, in what accounts basically to a new form of colonialism. Um, and these are communities that are very deeply connected to their land. Um, they have spiritual connections, they have uh, cultural connections, they have uh, very strong socioeconomic connections to the land. And they are, there's generally a lot of people within those communities that are very opposed to any kind of activity that involves a transfer of land control from communities to external players, such as large energy co uh, corporations. And that's exactly what is happening. Uh, so this is not just one isolated case. This is a case where it started already a long time ago. That this, this process of transfer of rights from indigenous communities to, to companies started around uh, 2004. So it's one of the places in the Global South where this process has advanced uh, more. And therefore, we can see the impacts also more clearly. But this is starting to happen. Uh, in many other countries in the Global South. Uh, there is very bad cases also in Africa, uh, particularly in Kenya. I can go more into detail in one particular case that involves a lot of public uh, taxpayers' money from Europe, uh, especially for Nordic countries, and that involves a massive uh, land grab as well from uh, four different uh, indigenous peoples, four different tribes in Northern Kenya. Uh, and, but there are many more examples all over the world. And what is even more worrying is that this is becoming a trend. Yeah. So something has to be done about this. Because the consequences of this are, well, basically, uh, as is natural, um, you know, the communities see this as a form of colonialism. There you see, well, on the left uh, top side, you see an example of one of such uh, wind farms already built. Um, and it's a very dense use of the territory. There is a lot of energy per square meter. So it's a very heavy civil works intervention in, in an indigenous territory which leads to the perception that you see on the top right. You know, there's, there, that's the depiction of uh, the wind energy by indigenous communities as the three ships of Columbus covered with wind turbines and with the names of the primarily Spanish companies that are taking over their lands. And as a consequence, you have you know, all these processes of resistance, people defending their land, including the sacred sites, and actually sometimes also succeeding. In this particular case, uh, Latin America's largest project, a 396 megawatt wind farm, which involves a very large consortium with Mitsubishi, PGGN, Macquarie, you know, men, large investors and companies, including PGGN, which is one of the, one of the world's largest pension fund administrator, uh, invested uh, su substantial resources. The overall, uh, you know, when, when it reached financial close in 2012, this was a billion dollar project with the involvement of many different banks from all over the world, HSBC, Santander, Credit Agricole, many different banks, a huge syndicate. It reached financial close in 2012 and it hasn't broken ground yet. It's, uh, you know, the, the wind turbines started being delivered in 2012 and they've been sitting in a harbor since five years and nothing has been done. Uh, because the indigenous peoples have been able to defend their territory. So there you, you get into a very um, bad situation for all players. You get a, into a very bad situation for climate, uh, you know, for the climate in general, because a, a project that could be saving very significant uh, emissions is not being built. You get in a very bad situation for the communities that have, have suffered a lot of violence, many people have been arrested. You know, you, you see in the bottom right also, you know, amount of, uh, state repression that is associated with these kind of projects, you know, with militarization and several people have been killed in the course of protests, many people have been arrested. So communities are suffering a very, very high cost from this. And the sector as, as a whole is also suffering from many different impacts, but the most important impact is uh, on the most important asset that renewable energy has, which is the amount of public support and sympathy that it enjoys. And this intangible asset is very, very precious. It has to be protected from these kind of bad practices. So that's the situation as it is right now. As I said, it's a very bad situation for our players, uh, but there are alternatives. You know, the same communities that are opposing these kind of bad practices, this kind of you know, corruption, land grabs, violence, and so on, are actually in favor of community projects on their land. Because that means, amongst other things, that they will not lose control over the land and that they will be able to shape the project, that the project will be respectful to their use of their territory, to the way they relate to it, and so on and so forth. 
Um, the challenge is that these communities don't have money to invest. So the kind of financial models that have been used for community power in Europe, in North America, in Japan, and so on, uh, which is that communities provide the equity and then they get, you know, they, they provide 20 to 30 percent of the cost of the project and then they get the rest from the bank, cannot be applied in that context. The communities cannot come up with 20 percent equity or 30 percent equity. So uh, basically, that's why we created Jansa as an organization to, on one hand, support communities that are, that are defending their rights, especially their land rights in this context, and help the communities that want to install uh, utility scale projects on their land uh, to do so through a form, uh, through a financial model that protects um, uh, collective rights, protects community ownership, and is structured around social environmental objectives. Uh, I'll just go through this very quickly. Mm, you know, we are a nonprofit uh, renewable energy developer, so we, that's that's the slide that shows. You know, that, that's what the first thing that we show when communities approach us. We never propose or promote a project. We only respond to initiatives that come from the community itself. And then the beginning of the conversation is about values and objectives. Uh, there's a number of values around social, gender, intergenerational justice, non-commercial relationship to the land, restora environmental restoration, and so on and so forth, which is the basis of the conversation and the basis for the project. If, if the community shares these values, then there's a common ground to build upon. Uh, and then, well, we, we talked to them about the financial model, in which I will go a little bit more in detail, and a, met a methodology where we actually only get to talk about the project at the very end. The very first part has to do with what the community wants for its future. How, how it sees its future as a community, what kind of challenges it's facing, what resources it has, what it needs. You know, it's a methodology that it's, it's been developed by in, uh, Latin American indigenous community. It's called Plan de Vida. So that's, we go through that whole process with the community, discuss the role of a potential renewable energy project within that Plan de Vida, and talk about the governance of all that, how the community is going to govern and manage these significant assets, which requires also very clear agreements on how the financial flows are going to be managed, you know, how the training is going to happen for the community to actually take over more and more the, the control over the assets and so on and so forth. And then we go into territorial planning and participatory impact assessment by the community with impact from, I input from experts, but done by the community. And then on that basis, we actually define, well, together with the community, the, the project is defined. So that's, that's, that's how we go about a, project development. In terms of the financial model, well, we use a, um, a legal form, I'm not gonna go very much into details, but we're using a legal form that is called Community Interest Company, limited by guarantee. It's a kind of company that doesn't have shareholders and is structured around uh, social and environmental objectives. The objectives are the owners of the company, basically. And uh, so we set together with, with each community a project-specific community interest company with objectives defined by the community itself. And, uh, you know, then that's, that's, that's a UK legal form. The, the British have invented this legal form. So we use that in the UK, but then through a national subsidiary, that's the one, the operating company that receives uh, investment uh, in the form of loans, of soft loans, and sells the electricity and with the revenue pays, uh, repays the debt, but there is a, there is a margin, there is a, there is a difference between the returns and the cost of capital, and that half of that goes month after month to the community, 25% goes to the development of future projects under the same model in other communities through JANSA, which is also that kind of uh, legal entity, a community interest company limited by guarantee. And another 25% goes to a guarantee instrument to provide safety, uh, you know, to secure community ownership over the long term until the debt uh, service is totally repaid. Um, the kind of investors that work on this space are different kind of investors at different times in the life cycle of the project. At the beginning, in the development phase, there is a lot of risk. So we operate primarily uh, with grants and with impact first investments, like really committed impact first investors. That's primarily program related investments from foundations in the United States and this kind of, you know, this kind of profile of investors. Then for construction, that's like impact investors, uh, you know, the foundation endowments, family offices and so on. And once the projects are already operating and there's a, some track record of that, then it will be possible to refinance them with institutional investors, freeing up this kind of committed capital to finance the initial phases, the initial stages of other projects. Um, right now we're working on three projects in Chile where we've been part of a process of design of new public policies to foster community ownership of renewable energy and in particular indigenous ownership of community of, of renewable energy. 
Uh, and we're also working in projects in Mexico where the public policies are not so good. And it's an uphill battle trying to change these policies. This is actually one of the key dimensions, the, the public policy dimension. We can talk about that more later if you want. Um, and then as a last point, um, together with Gaia and the Swift Foundation, we're working on a platform um, to work uh, more systematically and through a global alliance on, on all these issues, you know, on, on improving the social environmental performance of the transition to renewable energy. You know, basically, it will be a, a, an online platform and an alliance uh, that will document uh, both very good practices, you know, like promote good practices, but also expose bad practices and create uh, alliances to stop these bad practices and uh, basically transform the way the energy transition is unfolding. And we want to do that on two different aspects. Uh, on one hand, supply chain and life cycle management, and Hal is going to talk more about that. And on the other hand, uh, everything that has to do with project deployment, uh, you know, project development, construction, operational maintenance, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we're right now, we're, we're finishing the online platform. It's almost operational, but we're actually also looking for m more organizations and more people who are interested in this particular dimension of the energy transition, because we are, as I said, also, we want to build a broad alliance to launch this next year. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to take us to a very specific region in the world, the Africa region, um, and shifting gear a little bit to talk about how we as women are thinking about and starting to advance what we call a just, a gender just energy system that actually supports development, um, that does not violate rights and that transitions us to a model of development that's not based on extractivism. So I just wanted to quickly talk, I have mentioned a little bit um, what WOMEN is, but we're a regional alliance of more than 50 allies. We work across um, three sub-regions in Africa, um, and our principal focus is to, su to support women's organizing and movement building. So I'm gonna just organize um, my presentation around a couple of points. And the first one that I wanted to address was, it's really important that when we think about a just renewable energy system, it's framed by particular ideas. And we essentially, we address the whole question of what we call patriarchal extractivism. So extractivism is an idea that comes out of Latin America, but has really informed our political perspectives and our work as women. Um, extractivism is essentially a, a model of development that's organized around the logic of extraction. This is a model of development that's been prevalent for centuries and involves the extraction of large quantities of raw materials that are then exported from peripheral or marginal areas of the world to the centers of capital and wealth. And this model of development in our analysis creates a lot of injustice and inequality in the world. Um, extractives would, would apply to industrial agriculture, industrial fisheries or forestry. It also applies obviously to the extraction of minerals, oil and gas. Um, in our work in the region, and we're working to support women's organizing, and one strand of it is around energy and climate justice, what we're seeing in our region is a model of renewable energy which we define as extractivist. And that is because we're seeing it's mainly a corporate-led rollout of renewable energy. There's very little community involvement, especially there's no involvement of, of women in most of these projects. And we're seeing the violation of many rights through these projects. We're seeing land grabs. We're seeing um, energy projects in which energy is created but then shipped out of regions. So it's, it's not unlike fossil fuels projects. We work on coal and oil mainly, but their communities and women specifically complain of the fact that they are carrying the brunt of the costs of these fossil fuels extraction and combustion but are not enjoying any of the benefits. And in a sense, the model of renewable energy that we're seeing rolled out in most of our region replicates that same model. So that's the first point I wanted to make. Um, just to talk a little bit around our work on fossil fuels, energy, and climate justice. 
Um, as mentioned, we started in 2012, and our initial focus was broadly on extractive industries. But we very rapidly moved to a focus on fossil fuels. So we, in 2015, we organized the first um, regional exchange of women um, from coal-impacted communities. And then from there evolved a much wider focus to fossil fuels. Um, our, our point was of the contestation, the demand that fossil fuels energy come to an end, that we keep reserves in the ground. Um, and that position was informed by the fact that it was communities across the region that were carrying enormous costs, externalized costs of this fossil fuels based energy system. And that the, the longer term implications of this model, climate change, were bearing down most heavily on women in sub-Saharan Africa. That is the reality. But um, we, we, we soon realized that we needed to be propositional. We couldn't challenge fossil fuels and, and hold to a demand to keep reserves in the ground if we weren't thinking about the alternatives. And that's sort of taken us down a new road of work. And I think our political perspectives and framing lead us to ask different questions and propose different solutions to more welfare-based renewable energy models addressing women's interests. Um, then I just, just as, as Linda was saying earlier, just to sort of very briefly touch on and map out the context in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that throughout sub-Saharan Africa, it's actually the region in the world where there is least access to electricity. Now I know electricity is just one form of energy access, but I think the statistics are quite revealing. Um, so in sub-Saharan Africa, um, there are 625 million people living without electricity or with very limited ac access to electricity and other safe, affordable um, means of access to energy. That basically translates to two out of every three people do not have access to electricity. So the majority of Africans, and again, this is a burden, energy poverty is a burden that falls to African women because of the division of labor. So women are primarily responsible for care and social reproduction, the maintenance of what we call a subsistence economy, and that means that it's women that are the ones that are walking significant distances to get access to energy, often placing themselves at severe risk. So we've had a numerous um, examples of women who, in the process of collecting energy, are exposed to high risks of sexual violence. So in Uganda, we had an energy assembly meeting, and there were a couple of people here at that meeting. But there, women reported about the fact that forests had been taken over and militarized. And as women ventured into these militarized areas, they were either forced to submit to sexual relations, or they were raped or gang raped. So these are just the realities of, of women's, basically a woman's experience of energy poverty in Africa. Um, because the electricity and safe energy is really not available, there's a heavy reliance on traditional fuels, on biomass, and we know the implications of that. In 20, 2012, of 915 million people living in sub-Saharan Africa, nearly 713 million used wood and dung to heat their homes and, and use this for cooking. Um, so that just sort of, I think, is quite an important map of um, what's, what's happening in the energy region, in, uh, in the Africa region around energy. Um, in our work, what we're doing is supporting women's organizing in, at, at this stage, five countries, Kenya, Uganda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Africa, and Nigeria. Um, we're working in areas that are currently impacted by fossil fuels, energy, um, and in which the majority of people experience extreme energy poverty. And we're supporting women's organizing and movement building. And the logic there is, because women are the ones that primarily carry the impact of energy poverty and the externalized costs of fossil fuels production, um, women constitute a really important for movement, uh, an impetus for a very different energy system. And so we really think about a renewable energy system from their perspective, from their vantage point. And it's not about women articulating what that renewable energy system needs to look like, but really working with women to support their organizing, their knowledge production, and their proposals around what a just renewable energy system would look like. Um, in this process, we've been running energy assemblies with women, and we'll be holding another one in Nigeria um, this month. Um, and these have been really important um, 
forums in which women can really articulate their experiences around energy and their proposals for what they want to see from an energy system. And the dimensions of that coming up are obviously it's, it needs to be affordable, um, it needs to be locally controlled. They have a strong awareness of the fact that um, large grids place electricity out of reach for the majority of rural people. So they are relying on small energy technologies already, but they are very clear it's going to be microgrid. It's going to be very localized energy solutions that will provide justice for the majority of African women. Um, so the, the, the next point that I wanted to come to was... Um, is just the centrality, and I think this echoes what Sergio and Linda were saying, that a just energy system cannot achieve its purpose. It cannot be realized if we do not see community leadership, specifically women's leadership, and the right of consent. And so what I just wanted to talk about was um, the idea of energy sovereignty, because this is an idea that really um, has emerged from our work, and the way that we've distilled it down it really means that women define their own energy needs. A renewable energy system should be affordable and locally controlled. And there are three dimensions that I'd like to emphasize. Um, as I've said, it must arise from and be grounded in community organizing, centrally within this women's organizing, women's leadership, and women's vision around a just energy system. Um, a community-led and gender-just energy system cannot, can only be achieved if communities and women give consent for renewable energy projects. And the last point that I wanted to make on this is that I talked about extractivism earlier, and a just energy system is not achievable within, ex within an extractivist development logic. So as long as renewable energy projects are causing land dispossessions, as long as renewable energy projects if they continue on a basis of taking forests, water, people's lands, um, this is not a just energy system. And so what I just wanted to talk a little bit was around our experience of what um, the process, the principles, what a just, a movement towards a just, a gender just energy system might look like. Um, so in Women, we've been supporting women's organizing and I think no matter which interests actors are pushing or supporting a renewable energy project, there is going to have to there's going to have to be support to organising and women's organising specifically. So we've been creating what we call um, women-only safe spaces, um, forums in which women can build an understanding of energy and energy poverty in a more systemic basis, um, and can articulate their aspirations and needs about energy. Um, we've been doing this, as I mentioned, energy forums, but we also support um, women's movement building schools regionally, and um, in 2018, we'll be moving to national schools. These are vehicles to support women's organizing and consciousness raising. Um, it's absolutely critical if we are going to see women um, centrally involved in um, advancing just renewable energy. Um, it's about what knowledge we're valuing, and so for us, um, there is vast knowledge around energy. Um, there's vast knowledge about how people use land, um, what their development interests are in communities. And so we've been supporting participatory action research, um, and that's really been to support women build knowledge around energy, um, how energy poverty is affecting them, but also provide a platform for women to start proposing energy alternatives. And that... Um, and we're building advocacy and influencing from below, mainly through a regional campaign, which is led by women in the region. Um, I just want to finally touch on a few um, ideas around consent for women in Africa. So um, we know that mega mining and um, mega development projects are riven through, and that's been mentioned by Sergio with conflict. Um, and this conflict really centers around the control of territory, the control over re resources. Renewable energy projects are creating the same conflicts and tensions if you do not have community ownership and community involvement. Um, in, in the Africa region, as in el el elsewhere in the world, um, consent um, can be claimed through statute. Um, in our region, it's not just particular to indigenous peoples, it's traditional communities who own and manage land communally. And so consent is drawn 
is, is argued for on the basis of traditional rules and laws, how people manage land and resources. Um, in, in, women, in the case of women and consent, it's a deep challenge in Africa, I think, as it is in other parts of the world, because we have to be talking about women's rights of consent. It's not just community consent. And in traditional communities, women do not own land. It's not ownership in the Western sense, but they, they generally marry into patrilineal communities. They do not gain uh, formal rights over land. Those land rights remain with men, and so women access use rights through a male in their family. So the, the land rights for women are very tenuous, and with land rights comes membership of a community. And so women are generally, because they marry into patrilineal communities, they're not seen as members of communities. So they get locked out of decision making, including decision making around development projects. So this is a conundrum. Um, and the only really way to unlock that conundrum if we want a just energy system is to support women's organizing and voice in these communities, which is a, a process. And I'm not quite sure what that process looks like if it's private, if the energy rollout is private sector led, but it cannot be just if we do not see women's voice and women's interest. Um, I think the last thing I just wanted to say was um, we've, we had a very um, powerful meeting of African women in Nigeria in October 2015 in Nigeria in the Niger Delta. And um, out of that, we evolved a couple of key principles around a gender just energy system. And um, I'm just going to quickly conclude by reading out the declaration that women there adopted. Um, and the, the position was that we need to develop a rapid global transition from fossil fuels as the primary source of energy to a transformed renewable energy system, which one, respects the land and natural resource rights of communities and women specifically, two, guarantees work and decent livelihoods for local communities and women in particular, treats energy as a collective wealth from which all citizens must benefit, uh, four, guarantees clean energy that is affordable and accessible to all. Um, five, derives from government-supported research and financial investment in popular, democratically controlled, decentralized renewable energy options in which women play a leading role given their gendered interests in energy. So I'll conclude on that basis. Thanks. So hello everyone. Um, uh, yeah, so I, my name's Hannibal. I work with the Gaia Foundation, like I said earlier. Um, and I want to thank for Sergio and, and Sam and, and Linda for, for setting me up so nicely, because there's actually quite a few things I don't have to describe now, which is uh, excellent. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, the just transition that we've all described, um, which I think holds within it this commitment to 100% renewable energy as quickly as possible but as well as possible. And, and the thing is that we can't get there unless it is done as well as possible. Business as usual won't get us there. So I'm going to be talking about um, that transition in a different part of the renewable energy supply chain. So our work focuses on, on the extraction of primary resources, as they're called. Um, so minerals, metals, and fossil fuels. Um, but we're not actually looking under the Ajuso project at the fossil fuels and how we can go beyond the extraction of those because that, that's a given. Um, instead, we're looking at this other transition which is happening sur surrounding the, the re transition to renewable energy and driven by it, which is transition from a 20th century fossil fuel economy to a 21st century metals and minerals economy. So those are the things that are going to take over the role of fossil fuels in powering society, powering economies. And that there is a list compiled from US Geological Survey, Survey and British Geological Survey data of all of the minerals and metals that find some application in the renewable energy economy, whether it be in the screens of, of solar PV, in, in wind turbines, in permanent magnets, or anything that, that from, you know, the, the most basic construction materials to very specific uses within those. So 
the scenario that's being put forward at the moment for this transition to a minerals and metals economy, which is obviously essential to the renewable energy transition, is mostly being dominated by the mining industry, which sees it as an inevitable rollout and expansion of mining globally, which is a serious, serious expansion if you look at those uh, facts up on the screen. So the ICMM, which is the International Council for Minerals and Metals, estimates a 5 to 18 percent annual overall global production increase in minerals over the next 40 years, so around to uh, mid-century. Uh, and that is largely driven by the need to supply clean energy technology and high, ele high electronics, the, the digitalization of industry and so on. And that is under a 100% clean uh, renew renewable energy scenario. And then you can see below it how that rolls out into demand for key minerals and metals like copper, lithium and rare, rare earth minerals. And that's a, that's a huge expansion in extraction. So what does that mean if, that, if the transition happens in that, in that way? It means severe ecological impacts, and that has direct implications for the climate. So significant direct emissions. At the moment, the mining industry is making, or the larger players in the mining industry are making, taking steps to bring renewables into their practices. But still, a large percentage of global energy consumption of fossil fuels goes towards mineral and metal crushing. It's around 6%, so it's a large percentage. You have increasing water, water use, which causes desertification of ecosystems. And I'll show a picture later that, that demonstrates that and obviously releases huge amounts of carbon. Deforestation, biodiversity loss, and ecosystem fragmentation. And that reduces the, the, the ecological resilience of Earth as a system and of specific ecosystems. Uh, and the particular issue there is that we often think, well, still those of us who uh, participate in these spaces and talk about climate change a lot of, uh, as a carbon issue. But of course, ecosystem integrity and biodiversity play a critical role in mitigating climate change, and we can't afford to lose any more. And then we have a series of multiplication effects, which in, in addition to the general increase in demand, are going to mean bigger, more destructive, and more widely distributed mines. Some of those effects are social and political. So for example, the dominance of China in uh, the production of rare earth minerals and metals, they account for around 90% of global supply, means that the, the, the European Union and the US's uh, raw material strategies are pretty much entirely based around that list of critical minerals and how to increase domestic supply. So we're going to see a proliferation of mining globally uh, as opposed to where all the resources could be got from. It's going it's to spread out because of ease of access. Uh, another factor is this, this trend we're seeing here. So this is the general decrease in, in ore concentrations. We've mined so much over the last century or so that the, the resources that are, and the deposits that are left available to us for most minerals and metals for that transition are decreasing in quality. And what that means, which you can see from the quote on the bottom, is the, that the mining metric is that you need to have more destruction, more, more creation of overburden, as it's called, or mining waste for every new mine. More waste is produced for every ounce or gram or tonne of ore produced. So the, the ecological devastation is not only spreading globally, it's also going to be increasing in terms of the scale of each of the projects themselves. So the cumulative effect, which is poorly researched, is very, going to be very large. And this is one of, the, one of the examples of the consequences of that kind of uh, trend in, in, in extraction and in mining. This is a picture from Samarco um, in Minas Gerais, which means General Mines, the, the name of the whole area in Brazil, where in 2015 there was a huge dam spill which claimed several lives and polluted the Rio Doce, which ironically enough now means Sweet River. Um, all the way down to the Atlantic coast, over about 500 kilometers. And these disasters are becoming more and more frequent because the technology uh, to, well, the environmental technology of safely storing waste is not keeping up with the need and the, the, the size and rate of, ex of extractive expansion. Okay, so there's this, there's this ecological multiplication which has very direct impacts for the climate, but it also has direct impacts on, on people. And that not only comes through these conflicts over land that we've been talking about, but we have to also consider that increasingly these communities are in a position where they're being asked to adapt to climate change as it's already happening, and mining reduces their resilience to do that. 
by taking land or water and other critical resources out of the hands of communities, reducing access, or through disasters. In the Philippines, they talk about mining as part of disaster preparedness seminars, so having this understanding that mining reduces people's resilience to respond to the disasters that are becoming more, aggre um, more devastating due to climate change. And we also, we've also touched on increased social and political resistance, which I'll come to in a minute. And then at the bottom there, we were talking about water earlier. That's uh, Lake Pupo in, in Bolivia. Um, and that's a classic example of the convergence of factors where mining pro projects upstream of the river, of the, of, the, of the lake, have been draining water off, combined with the impacts of climate change and severe El Nino as a result of the climate intensification of that effect, have basically dried that lake up and hundreds and thousands of people have had to migrate. They're no longer able to, to live there, which also causes other stresses. So overall, what this is showing is that the ecological and social justice dimensions of this renewable energy transition, if it relies on these kinds of mining technologies, if it relies on this expansion of mining as the industry suggests that it must, will lead to not only a massive risk to whether that happens because of ecological breakdown, but also because of social resistance. So a recent analysis showed how successful that resistance can be, and that resistance will only get, uh, get more ardent around the world as people feel the impacts of climate change. So of 346 contested mining projects analyzed, one in five of them were stopped or severely disrupted, causing major expense to companies, and many of those were abandoned as a result of that. And uh, there's a very interesting report on that, which I can, I can talk about or later on. And uh, yeah, so center of social, social responsibility and mining, just talking about that, that major impact that social unrest can have and the likelihood of that increasing. Uh, and finally, those who are opposing mining at the moment because of this expansion and because of the, the major drivers, especially in the form of overconsumption for it, when people stand up to, to resist mining operations on their land, it's the deadliest industry to oppose in the world with 33 environmental and human rights defenders killed opposing the industry in 2016. Um, that number is likely to be a lot higher, so that's just available data. Okay, so what can we do about that? What can we do to address that in these injustices and the threats that, and risks that they pose to the rapid and effective transition to a just renewable energy system? Well, firstly, there are kind of supply side actions that can be taken if you want to look at it as a, from a supply chain perspective. One of them is dramatically improving the implementation and enforcement of community-led and focused free prior informed consent. So we've already heard contributions of how that could happen in the, in the case of renewable energy, but in the case of mining, that also needs to be a major concern. And, it needs, and Wayman can speak a lot more about how that can be a truly community-led and just process. But as another example at the bottom there, I really can't pronounce the name, but I have <laughs> communicated with them recently. They have ha this, this First Nation in, in Canada from an area called Kamloops held their own environmental impact assessment and free prior and informed consent process on the basis of their own uh, traditional knowledge, their knowledge of their land, their rights as, as, as landholders there, uh, and also the basis of what they've suffered over the last 500 years of, of colonialism. And that's a very interesting uh, example of how EPIC can be led from a community perspective and have uh, real impacts rather than just be a box ticking exercise. Uh, we need to legislate for mining, mining companies to internalize the full social and ecological costs of their operations and legacies. At the moment, they benefit for a huge amount from not having to pay for the, 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 the social and ecological costs. They usually don't compensate people adequately, adequately even for what they've directly lost and what can be proven, let alone the legacy of the mine over hundreds of years afterwards. And it shouldn't be the case that those companies are only held to account when you have a vast disaster like we had in Samarco. Uh, and lastly, at the moment, there's a process in the UN, which, uh, which Wayman can also speak to better than I can, but it's uh, f to, to create a binding treaty on transnational corporations with respect to human rights, because at the moment, they benefit from a kind of transnational impunity. It makes it very hard to hold them accountable for, for, for human rights abuses committed overseas. All of those would be really good, and they would be an excellent start, 
but the fact of the matter is, is that as long as we have the incentives for the industry to expand, which is to say from the, d the demand, which is largely driven by overconsumption in nations in the global north and emerging economies in the global south, or the elites within those economies, uh, there will always be a pressure on governments and on companies for those things to be a process or a, an exercise that they have to do to get the projects pushed through because the d demand will continue to exist and it Brutally speaking, it will still be profitable to try and push through those processes. So I want to make reference here to the, the, the SDGs, which is that, and SDG goal 12 in particular, which talks about circular economy and the potential of that to be providing the needs of the, the renewable energy transition uh, without causing this wave of, of new extractive violence. There's a huge amount of potential which is at the moment being largely undervalued and ignored because of uh, expense and, and not being acted on at all by governments uh, or, or transnational bodies in a, in a really, uh, or invested in, I should probably say. And that's the amount of uh, these, these uh, materials, especially copper and other things like that, which are essential to the renewable energy economy that are available above ground. So there you have a, a, uh, uh, an image which shows you how much is available in the degrading ores of primary resources and how much is available in secondary ores, which is what's found in, in waste piles, landfills, e-waste dumps, and so on around the world. Devices is like mobile phones. Um, and then we also have PWBs, which are like circuit boards. And you wouldn't believe the amount of those which are just simply dumped with huge amounts of useful minerals and metals in them. quote about uh, copper in particular because it's such a, a crucial uh, a mineral and to say that globally there's a stockpile of 225 million tonnes of copper that's sitting in landfills alone. So that's not, that's anything that's been, has gone into landfill, not just what's being, not being used in other areas of waste. So there's a, a huge amount of potential there and also I had a very interesting conversation with Sergio the other day where we were saying okay the, the first big expansion of renewable energy was came starting around 20 years ago that's now coming to a close so you have all of this decommissioning that's going to have to happen opening up a new channel for reinvestment in the circular economy. Uh, and finally, just to end, I'm going to come back to this list of um, minerals and metals, and I want to make a point that these minerals and metals are also used, they're, they're also the same suite of metals that are used in high-tech military uh, uh, applications and also in our consumer electronics of all kinds. So there's a huge potential, if we are willing to take the bold political action to do it, to allay demand from these non-essential over-consumed sectors uh, and create the space to meet as much uh, of the demand for renewable energy as possible from recycled uh, urban mind and, and, and other sources to try and reduce as much as possible the need for any further extraction. And I believe that's truly essential to a just transition. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, I think we've heard uh, a great deal of information about work that's being done to help us achieve what the Paris Agreement calls this just transition and climate justice for both people and planet. So now I'm going to scoot to the back of the room and grab microphones so that uh, we might be able to uh, respond to questions. And maybe, Sam, you might want to. Oh, you'll go get them? Oh, thank you. All right. Um, while Hal has. Uh, graciously offered to get the microphones. Do, does anybody have any questions for anybody on the panel? And please feel free to direct your questions to one of us or all of us. And, and if you also have input on any of this, we'd love to hear it. Hello. Good morning, everyone. My name is Annelies. I'm a member of the European Parliament. I've been very inspired about uh, your projects you're taking on. We had a long, long debate in the European Parliament, for example, on uh, conflict minerals, so to say, their bloody minerals, and, and, and really fostering and having the supply chain and trying to really have a legal binding situation. We have to go that step, and uh, you're, you're doing really groundbreaking work. I really like the uh, project on, on the women and energy. Um, for me, the interesting point is th the SDGs are not much known even in the European Parliament. Yes, we are there with the delegations. I've been twice in New York. 
but um, I wonder how you, in your, all of your projects, you mentioned that in your latest presentation, making the link to the SDGs. I think this is crucial because all the governments have signed the SDGs. So making the accountability towards these countries through the SDGs, and for me it would be very interesting in all of your projects, how much use your SDG, you, you use the SDGs yourself as a tool to discuss that issues to governments, to stakeholders, to business like churches straightforward, and, and if that has been of success. Thank you so much for your work. Um, uh, there are a couple of questions on this side, but I'll briefly respond to that. that, that. Um, thank you for passing the mic. Um, I, I can tell you in the sort of the impact investing community that, that we work with, uh, people are looking for ways to identify how well they're doing. And so the SDGs do come up quite often um, because there isn't a really clear way that people have agreed on to say, you know, this is showing us uh, the impact that we're having. People want to know they're doing good with their money. Um, so the SDGs have been quite a bit uh, discussed. And I know that uh, UNDP and others are looking at ways to take information from the SDGs and combine it with some other thinking to come up with these types of metrics. So it's, it's, it's very valuable. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sam from Nigeria. And I was going to ask uh, the woman who presented on women in energy as regards um, what has been your experience with working with uh, regional or national governments in Africa and in Nigeria? And uh, what is the sustainability strategy you're putting in place for as regards most of your projects in Africa? Thank you. Yeah, why don't we take a couple of questions and yeah, and then we'll then we'll respond. Um, I, this this uh, man had his hand up and then in the back. Um, hello, my question is for uh, Sergio. Um, you mentioned a project in Kenya where uh, things didn't went so well. Um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on it. Thanks. Okay, and then I think there's one in. The, okay, one in the back and one in the front, and then we'll answer a few. Hello. Uh, my name is Atlan from the Save the Tigris uh, River campaign in Mesopotamia region. Uh, my question is about actually the transition of this renewable energy issue. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some countries promote uh, the hydropower as a clean energy since it's pulling out the fossil fuels. And we should also discuss the impacts of this big hydropower issues. Uh, for example, in Turkey, the, they are building big uh, dams in this uh, Tigris River and it affects the, the indigenous peoples and their cultural heritage uh, negatively. Uh, so what do you think about these issues? And the second question is about the SDGs and Paris Agreement. Unfortunately, they, are, uh, they look um, inefficient. And as, as he mentioned also, uh, since it is kind of voluntarily uh, agreement, and uh, although countries have signed these issues, they don't care about the, uh, the results, and they don't take into account the of these agreements. Thank you. Thanks. And then we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll line this up and then we'll take a few more. Yeah. Great, thank you. And I'm, uh, I run a small impact investment advisory business, mm -hmm. but I'm also on the board of the Climate Markets and Investment Association, so financial institutions who are looking to do the right thing which is difficult to identify these days. And you know they have some experience on implementing FPIC processes, but they are very long in general. So it, it's very hard for them to, to work with those. Um, so, so maybe just a reflection on you know, what is your experience? Are you actually working with corporates as well on identifying sort of the right ways to go about? I hear from the cases in Mexico that this is something you're doing, which is great, but also on the extractive industries. I guess assuming that you know, if we if we imply proper practices and if if we use more recyclable um, minerals and metals, then the costs will probably go up. Um, to which respect, you know, how do we how do we step up communications to us consumers? I guess you know, who will at the end of the day pay for that price? And which is you know, maybe electronics are too cheap overall. Anyways, is this something that we need to understand and digest? Are you in communication with corporates to help them understand that and? how to integrate those costs into their products and services to then actually, you know, how can their products actually reflect the full price, you know, including the externalities um, and con communicating that to consumers. Any thoughts on that would be great. Thank you. Thanks. 
Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go through these questions and then hopefully have time for, I think we will have time for more. So I believe the first question was to you, Sam. So thank you for these questions. Um, in terms of the SDGs, so there were two separate questions that I'm going to link up. The one on how are we using the SDGs to build arguments and then um, my friend from Nigeria, your question about how are we relating to national and regional governments. Um, for, for us, our focus, as I mentioned, is really supporting women's organizing. So women themselves, grassroots impacted women, are driving solutions and that they're not imposed by us or by NGOs working in the region. And as you were talking about just now, it's a slow process. So we're, we've been working to build a campaign um, in five countries and building from below. So. Right now, the campaign is building, um, organizing is happening, and we haven't reached the stage where women have got sufficient clarity about what that just energy system looks like to be making demands on national and regional institutions. So I think we're probably about a year or 18 months off from serious advocacy um, with a clear vision of what an alternative renewable energy should look like from, from the perspective of the majority of women in Africa. Um, and I think the advocacy around SDGs would definitely come into influencing and advocacy strategies. Um, there was another question. Sorry, I'm so blind these days, I need glasses. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this whole question of FPIC, I think um, it is a very demanding process. The reality is it's about leveling the playing field. So when people enter into dialogue and negotiation around mega projects, whether they are fossil fuels, infrastructure, or renewable energy, there's a genuine dialogue. And that requires a lot of work because dialogue can only happen when the actors are more equal, are equal. And for communities who are living in distant rural areas with limited access to information, limited access to the law, if they can only genuinely function, be just, if people come to the playing field and, and with its communities who need to be informed, they need to have access to information, they need to have knowledge about the law and their rights. For women, it involves intensive organizing, so women's voice can come to the center of decision making. And leveling the playing field requires clarity about how people are thinking about development. And for communities living in territories where they rely on land, water, and other natural resources for reproduction and life, the, the notion, the model of development, the idea of development is very different to the model of development that's pursued through extractives and mega projects. So yeah, those are a few points I wanted to make. Thanks. Thanks, and I think you had a question. Yes, uh, well, first, in, in terms of the um, uh, SDGs, uh, I think they are very useful for people who want to do things right. They are not so useful to stop thi uh, things that shouldn't happen. Uh, and the same thing, I think, applies to many of the systems that are supposed to ensure certain standards in terms of environmental, social, and governance uh, you know, performance of, of projects. Um, we are seeing this over and over again, you know, including the way FPIC is implemented, which is incredibly, I mean, it's becoming a problem on itself uh, rather than a solution. Uh, the way we're seeing it, at least in Latin America, the way it's implemented, you know, based on, on the jurisprudence by the Inter-American Human Rights Court and you know, uh, OIT Convention 169 and so on and so forth, it depends on governments. And these governments are not really interested in obtaining, you know, in, in facilitating genuine processes of, of consent. They are actually interested in the projects happening. So um, that's why I think that's that's a whole other area. But, you know, the, the limitations, the shortcomings of the existing mechanisms to ensure certain environmental, social, um, and, and governance standards. Uh, under the current model, uh, it's, it's showing its limitations. And in, that's one more reason why community leadership is so important. If the communities are the ones giving shape to these projects, then by default, their views, their interests, their relationship to, to the context, and so on and so forth, will be at the center of the process. So that, on that question, on the question with uh, Kenya, uh, well, there's a number of problematic projects in Kenya, several of them, which are actually, it's, it's a, 
You know, for many organizations here in Europe, there's been, um, for many years, there's been a global campaign to expand feed-in tariffs. I don't know if you're familiar with feed-in tariffs. It's a mechanism to make uh, renewable energy projects more viable by providing a safe, fixed tariff and, you know, guaranteed offtake and so on and so forth. Can you implement the feed-in tariff, which uh, was widely celebrated, but because there was no infrastructure for communities to be able to take you know, to, to make use of this opportunity, what this ha what this resulted into was, uh, yeah, again, you know, like influx of uh, developers, many of which were very eager to make use of the vulnerabilities of the communities, of the fact that land rights are either not properly defined or even if they are defined, they are not enforced. Uh, so just focusing on one specific, specific case, there was a small Dutch company that somehow, in a way that is still, you know, the been examined by a judge, obtain land rights over 150,000 acres, that's about uh, 60,000 hectares of uh, native land in the north, in the Lake Tucana region, um, for nothing, for, I mean, literally for peanuts, like, like almost no cost. The, the communities were not even informed, the whole process that is, which is not perfect at all, but at least there is a process in the law to inform communities and ask for their opinion was not followed. And this has led to Sub-Saharan Africa's largest renewable energy project. It's called Lake Turkana Wind Power, uh, which is basically based on a land grab, on a massive land grab that affects four different indigenous communities, the you know, Turkana, Samburu, Rendilia, and El Molo. And it includes land that is very important, especially for the Rendilia people. That's where uh, um, once every 15 years, the initiation ceremony is done with all the youths. And um, well, the project has, in, well, this, this, this pirate basically got the land rights, but um, then he had to create a consortium because he couldn't provide all the equity. So uh, there you have money from the development agencies of Denmark, Norway, and Finland. Uh, you know, so that Danish, Norway, and, and Finnish taxpayers own equity in a land grab in Africa. Um, also from British companies and so on and so forth. And there's a big, again, a big syndicate of banks, including the European Investment Bank, including DEG, the German Development Agency, Proparco, the French Development Agency. You know, many, a lot of public money funding this land grab. And also money from development corporation to subsidize, you know, for example, road construction and so on and so forth. And it's been a really difficult process. Uh, the communities have been defending their rights in court. They obtained an injunction. Despite the injunction, the president himself, Uhuru Kenyatta, went to break ground to start the works. He went in person to break the injunction. Uh, the community that had to be displaced resisted, said they were not moving. Shortly thereafter, there was a massive killing in that village uh, involving former security personnel of the company. Some days later, using a, a vehicle from the company, this is all information from the inf affected communities themselves. Uh, one of the vehicles from the company was involved in a killing of uh, six boys who were taking care of cattle. That was all like the kind of tactics used to remove people. The, basically, people left the area and they were a threat. So here you have the kind of pattern that is normally associated with uh, fossil fuels, minerals, uh, being applied to renewable energy, all driven by public money, mainly by development money, and at a huge cost for Kenya because, uh, well, I, I could go for a long time into the very bad macroeconomic impact that this project, which makes actually no sense from a technical point of view, will have on, on Kenyan ratepayers. So it's a, it's a very clear example of how these things should not happen and why we need these flows of information and this communication and cooperation between communities in different parts of the world. Uh, we should not let the reputation of renewable energy be tainted by these kind of situations. And that's why we need this international networking. And I again repeat, you know, if you are interested in these issues, please look after us later. We would really like to work with anyone sharing these kind of objectives together. And Hal, did you want to respond to? Yeah, I'll just be quite swift. Um, on the SDG, SDG question, um, it's particularly interesting within Europe because Europe does have a, uh, a circular economy package, which is part of its uh, raw materials um, policy strategy. Uh, but it's it's the third pillar, um, which is to say the one that 
gets ignored in the favour of the first two pillars, which is aggressive trade strategy uh, to secure mineral supplies and mineral security from overseas, and the second one, which is, uh, which is increasing domestic supply. So really what I would advocate for there, and I agree with you completely, SDG 12 is a, is a juncture to do that, is to flip that. The priority has to be circular economy, um, and, and we, need to, we need to encourage our politicians to, 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 to emphasise that. So that's a really good point. On the issue of hydro, I think this, this raises a really interesting question, which is, I didn't get to it in my presentation, which is how the mineral energy nexus, as they call it in South Africa, between fossil fuels and, and the mining industry, which is an incredible generator of profit, um, could be replicated in the renewable energy economy. You're already seeing mega hydro, which has incredibly negative uh, impacts, in t including methane, massive methane emissions from flooded forests and so on, being used to power uh, uh, mining projects in a renewable way. But also, as those all, those all grades go down, more energy is required for mining. So whether that's coming from renewable sources or from fossil fuel sources, you're seeing industry taking up more and more of the capacity, which means you need to create more of the capacity to meet people's basic needs, which is the aim and, and as, in, as embedded in the SDGs. So we need to address the issue of extractivism and, and, and the use of hydro in that. Um, otherwise, we kind of just keep going around in a circle here. We don't question or get to the ultimate logic of, of why we're, we're in this situation in the first place. And then finally, I wanted to address the issue of how do we communicate um, this, because I think that is crucial. But I would probably suggest we have done in the as Gaia we have done consumer focused campaigns we're really small so we'd have a huge reach but using animation using other things and positive messaging and so on and I think we can see with the conflict mineral work that people do respond to it they do want products that are not you know bloody or uh, ecocidal but I actually think that most of the responsibility lies with the manufacturers who advertise these products and who convince people that they need them, who control the, the, the manufacturing schedule. Um, and I think that they also have the power to design in a different way, to design for recyclability. And we see examples like Fairphone who are trying to do that, but not at that huge scale that you have the likes of Apple and Samsung. But quite an interesting thing, uh, and perhaps this is another point for leverage, is that um, earlier this year, Apple announced in their new environment white paper that they hope, didn't set a time, to have a no mining supply chain. So for the largest technology company in the world with a vast turnover in mineral, minerals and metals to set that as a, as a, as a goal is significant. Um, and we need to pressure them and others on how that happens because at the moment they are not saying that they are going to reduce the turnover um, but rather you know that the overall supply might grow so I think that would be really important and we need to work those are the groups that we need to focus on working with in terms of communicating a new kind of uh, consumption yeah just just wanted to add something very quickly on hydro you know like we all know about the really bad impacts of large hydro and all the experiences but I think this is one good example of uh, you know there's a need to also not demonize technologies the, the problem is their use but there are also excellent uses of hydro that will be very necessary for the future. And you know, we were talking about this the other day. You know, like for me, actually, a 100% renewable energy system will need a lot of pumped storage. And the more pumped storage that we have, the less minerals that we will need to stabilize uh, the grid. Uh, and you know, there's now more and more examples of, you know, especially you know, pump storage at, at sea level. You know, pumping seawater quite high up and using that as an energy storage mechanism. And you can do that with relatively little, um, depending on the conditions, right? But relatively little environmental impact and systems that are very robust and last for a very long time. So just like a word of caution, like we should, I, I don't think we should demonize any technology. We should just be very, very um, you know, informed and critical about how they are used. Mm -hmm. I, I agree um, on, on that and on hydro and what, what you've all said. I just want to add one tiny point on the impact investing and consumer-facing products in particular. Um, at Planet Pledge, we do work with Ceres, um, you know, which is a consortium of uh, corporations that are looking to you know, uh, do more work to reduce uh, the impacts of climate change, and they've got a number of events going on over the next couple of weeks, um, and they have uh, many members who do have consumer-facing products and services um, 
um, and who have come out very strongly, you know, in favor. You know, when the when the U.S. pulled out of uh, the climate agreement, you know, took out the full page ads and say, you know, we're behind the climate agreement. We're doing what we can, and and we do see them starting to look at these issues and, and incorporating. Um, you know, better manufacturing processes um, and making the types of commitments that, that Hal just mentioned. So uh, it is something that we're starting to see more of uh, as more people demand these types of products. I have two young adult children and they and their friends are all very conscious about what they're buying um, and demanding more and they're, you know, in terms of costing more. I think that, you know, that's something that we also have to demand that it should not cost more, it should actually cost less. Yeah. Any, uh, could we take a few more questions? I think we have some time. There's a hand up here. Yeah, we have some time. Hi. Uh, I'm a student from Cornell University, and my question is primarily directed at Sam about women. So you mentioned that the community that you work in is very destitute, that two out of three individuals are not connected to any sort of energy sources. In that kind of a context, what sort of power sources does your organization receive in order to have its activities going on? And as a, both on an individual and on an organizational level, do you grapple with being better connected to power than the community that you work in? Um, I see a hand, of, two hands over there. Thank you for passing around the mic. Hi, my name's Kristen. I have a question about the concept of a circular economy. I'm wondering if you could just expand on how that would function. Um, and also, um, what sort of implications that would have for human rights? Like, if we were living in a circular economy, would that present certain benefits or challenges to human rights with slow growth? Yeah. Hi, I'm Savannah. I'm from Drexel University. Um, so my question is kind of in regards to this no mining supply chain. Um, so the no mining is obviously beneficial, but we see other issues with other types of supply chains, especially in regards to this e-waste and the circular economy of um, e-waste saying it's being recycled but actually being shipped overseas to places where there's no um, laws about workers' rights and stuff like that. So that's also negatively impacting communities. So I was just wondering if you have looked into that at all or like other ways that we can mitigate that. Thank you. My name is Catherine Westendorf. I work for the International Work Group for Indigenous Affairs, IFGIA. We are a human rights organization working with indigenous peoples worldwide. And um, I think it was fantastic presentations. I got a lot of <laughs> really inspiring thoughts. I would like to know, we work very much with an international human rights framework and human rights obligations. Do you use that kind of terminology in, in your work? Because, uh, and do you find it useful to use that kind of framework as well, as well as, for example, the UN guiding principles on human rights and business and human rights, etc.? Thank you. Yes, hello, my name is uh, Volker Ludwig. I'm here from Bonn, a policy influencer, and I have a question to Planet Pledge. You spoke about a new accountant uh, system, and I would be interested whether you have already developed something. So we had a, a number of questions with regard to the circular economy and mining, so Hal, maybe we'll let you go first unless you need a couple more minutes. Yeah. <coughs> how does the circular economy work? Um, people have different ideas about how that should work. Um, I can give a lot more information, uh, but from our perspective, the, the circular economy has a, possi has a possibility to concentrate wealth with serious uh, implications for human rights elsewhere, and like you said, their displacement of the costs onto people who are already bearing the main costs of climate change. For example, if growth continues or growth of resource extraction continues and demand keeps that growing, then those circular economies, will, even if they're established within a, a, a block like the EU or North America, the powerful, powerful blocks with high consumption, you will have a concentration of 
of those minerals and metals and as a source of wealth that will come into those systems and that could cause major issues in terms of human rights with those things uh, with with other places being underserved in terms of those things and it could be done according to wealth i think there is a risk that if we rely on purely market mechanisms that that will happen um, in terms of the general principle of how a circular economy works it's that it's basically uh, like a biomimicry modeling of of an economy so basically you would have all all uh, biological or biodegradable uh, uh, resources that come into the economy are either circulated back to the point of production as opposed to coming from from natural sources for more and more or from renewable sources or they or they're biodegradable so they can go in and become a new form of wealth you know and compost and other things like that but on on scale um, on the on the non-renewable side basically the idea is that it, some people propose it as a as a means of low growth or as a means of reducing uh, natural resource extraction and people go to different extents to which they think that should happen but for non-renewable resources the idea is that the vast majority of them with the right processes and more innovation and uh, and research is really required for a lot of these minerals and metals that we I put up on the board uh, because they're only now becoming really required at scale uh, but a lot of them last forever you know copper copper is one of the most highly recycled and yet there's still that huge stockpile there and, and technically it can be recycled over and over um, for, for the rest of time so that's that's how it should work things should go back to the point of production as opposed to going out of the system in waste so we have uh, we have a cradle to cradle approach where you go from the birth of that thing back to its birth rather than cradle to grave where you just discard everything and we have these huge burdens of waste and then to move on I'm, I'm sorry if that's dissatisfying but like I said it's a complicated one moving on to the other question about that that's kind of what we have I would class that e-waste problem as part of the cr the cradle to grave um, industry so I've worked on a report which included um, research and and case studies and first-hand reports from Agbog Bloshi, which is one of the biggest e-waste dumps in the world in Ghana um, and it's truly you know awful it's that firstly that people are living in those conditions but also that the the, the wealthy world in terms of economic wealth exports that that waste often uh, under the guise of IT for development or uh, other things when it's when it's really broken and then it's it's recycled back into local local economies in, in really dangerous ways so the way i would see it is that the circular economy is is looking to be or the circular economy that i would envisage would be looking as to be a solution to that so obviously it needs to be globally distributed but i think there's an opportunity when we talk about just transition and the way that trade unions and other to others talk about it that there's potentially a huge number of jobs that can be created to create those those feedbacks of of resources back into the system because it actually that, that's something we don't do and therefore there are not jobs around it and there isn't wealth being created around that and I would see that as something we could look to do although the global complexity of it I think escapes uh, everybody to an extent not just not just me um, uh, there was was that, that was it okay great sorry if that wasn't uh, quite um, it's Sam I think that uh, one of the questions was for you thank you very much for your question I think um, I mean, I think that as women, we are very clear that um, organizationally as an alliance, and we work at the regional level, so we work with partners and allies in 12 countries. Those partners and allies are very diverse. They include women's rights organizations and movements, environmental justice organizations and movements, climate organizations. Um, many of them are community-based organizations and networks. Um, the configuration of civil society in Africa is quite different from Latin America and Asia. We certainly don't see strong um, national movements. You mainly have sort of small community-based organizations and groups. I think it's really important that as organizations we really interrogate ourselves because if we're working with communities to advance a different development agenda, we need to be thinking very carefully about how we're working and how we're living. So I, I take that challenge very seriously. Um, we've worked very hard in the last few years co-constructing with the groups that we work the idea of how we see ecofeminism and how we see ecofeminist organizing shifting development paradigms. So that has been a co-construction and it's ongoing. So it's not us imposing a perspective from, from ourselves. 
Um, I mean, in that, we've asked critical questions about how we work with allies, how we partner with allies, um, how we relate to one another internally and in relation to our partnerships. So I think we've done quite a lot of work on that front. Next year, and we've been mobilizing resources for that in this year, we start testing, piloting what these alternative renewable energy systems could look like at a localized level with women. And I think that's going to issue new challenges to us around organizationally, how we live, how we use energy, how we consume. So I think we're on a trajectory, and I appreciate your question. I think it's an important one. Well, I think that our, our time has ended, and the, the question from the gentleman from Bonn, I can answer afterward, and the question from Catherine, um, I think, is a, is a great one to end on. Um, this idea of human rights, community rights, indigenous people's rights, nature's rights, um, that's a discussion that's just beginning. You know, How do we incorporate that? Paris Agreement called on us to be observant of that and trying to figure out how to do that. It's, it's totally possible, as you've heard today, um, but you know, this panel was a great way to start to have this discussion in a more meaningful way with all of you and so we're looking forward to further discussions and action um, by the groups here and many of you in the audience as we move forward so thank you all for attending and for your excellent questions and good luck